it says second of February, that's not right. That is no, that, that is what he did last December. week. But oh. we will... Are we doing it? Oh, these are... Those are last week. Okay. They're so probably the same. So is that what I'm reading? Yeah, that's the one. I'd... Thank you, Stephen. A number of guests duly introduced by fellows beg leave to attend your meeting. Is it your pleasure that I welcome them in your name? Thank you. Minutes. Society of Antiquaries of London, ordinary meeting, Thursday, the 2nd of February, 2023, Wellington House and online. Professor Martin Millett, president in the chair. The minutes of the ordinary meeting of Thursday, the 8th of December, 2022, were read and signed. The following, being in attendance and having signed the obligation required by the statutes, was duly admitted fellow, Yanis Galanakis. The following communication was then laid before the society. The antiquities trade in late 19th century Greece, stories of people and objects by Dr. Yanis Galanakis, FSA. Thanks for return for this communication. The president announced that the next meeting would be Thursday, the 9th of February, 2023, then adjourned the meeting and a reception followed. Is it your pleasure that I sign these minutes as a true and complete record? Thank you. Um, I've got two announcements um, to make. Um, the first is to remind uh, you that we're holding an event here next Tuesday, the 14th of February, on cultural heritage as the target and victim of war, first-hand reports from Ukraine. The event is free, uh, but places need to be booked via the website. Um, and hurry quickly to get places they're going quickly as they say, it promises to be a very um, informative and uh, useful day. And we have a number of uh, Ukrainian colleagues who are contributing to that. Um, second announcement is that following the revision to the nomination and balloting system, blue papers are now suspended online on the fellows platform um, in the documents tab. So we no long, now no longer read uh, the nominations for fellowship and meetings. Um, you can find the blue papers on the fellows platform website and a paper, uh, a balloting paper form for the 16th of February ballot, that's next week's ballot, plus blue papers for the ballot uh, that opens on the 15th of February and closes on the 16th of March. Thank you. Um, we now come to the main business of this evening's meeting, which is to hear um, our lecture. Um, our lecturers this evening are uh, our fellows, Mr. Toby Driver, who's a senior investigator for aerial survey at the Royal Commission in Wales, and also works on the EU-funded Cherish project, investigating cultural heritage, climate change in Ireland and Wales. And his res main research interests are in remote sensing and the study of Welsh health laws. Um, our other speaker, Andrew Fitzpatrick, is an archaeological consultant and honorary research professor at Leicester University. He's served on a number of our committees here, research, executive, council. He's a specialist in the Iron Age, um, who says here, never been afraid to explore finds that strike him as unusual. And depending <laughs> on your point of view, um, has been brave enough and rash enough to publish on the Druids. Uh, so uh, the paper this evening, um, if you forgive my uh, attempts at Welsh pronunciation, uh, Castel Nadolig and the Pembryn Spoons, a new investigation. Welcome to our speakers. <laughs> Oh, 
I think we're good to go now. Good. Well, as our president was saying, I, I do intend to start by talking about druidical things, not necessarily about the druids. Um, I want to explain why the spoons found at Castle Nadolig in the parish of Penbryn are special and why they help illuminate an enduring puzzle in the study of the British Iron Age as to what these objects were for. The spoons were found in 1829, so a little shy of 200 years ago. And they are typical in most regards. Uh, I have a technical, another technical problem here, the slide bar. Okay, no slides moving. Down or across? There we are, down. Down, right. The, the spoons from Castle Nadolig are typical in many ways of these objects, which date between about 400 BC to around 1 BC. And you can see from the, the image on the left that they are, although called spoons, they're really quite large and they would fit really into the palm of my hand. The spoons are usually found in pairs and the pairs are very similar in that in one spoon, there is a hole near one side, and you can see this on the left hand one just here. And then the other spoon has a cross incised in it. All the spoons that we know of, which have been found in Britain and Ireland and France, and Toby will be saying more about this later, all of the spoons have these, but only the spoons from Castle Nadolig have something unusual that makes them special. And that is a gold inlay and some other inlays that I'll come to later. Gold inlay is unusual on objects of Iron Age date and on objects from Britain and Ireland, it is vanishingly rare. And in order to understand this, I want to step away from spoons for a few moments and to look at how inlays are used on some other objects that I think help us understand the significance of the spoons from Penbryn. 
And these are the stamps that are found on Iron Age swords. Now, about 150 Iron Age swords scattered across Europe have armorers or makers marks on them. But only three or four have gold inlays on them. And here we see an example from Tour in Germany showing one of those few examples. So the small number of examples on long swords constitute perhaps 4% of the known total of these swords. And these stamps are found all the way across continental Europe, England, and you'll notice in Northwest Wales at the deposit at Limkentbach. These stamps are also found on short swords. And short swords are a different type of weapon. Although the typology of swords changes through the Iron Age, essentially they become longer as we see more and more use of cavalry and the longer slashing sword, short swords stay pretty much the same size for 400 years. So they would it would seem, are not combat weapons, but they have a rather different use. And if we look at where we find stamps on short swords, we find only nine. Now that's about 15% of the known examples of short swords. And what's interesting about these stamps is they're all in gold. There's just one sword that is slightly different and that's marked in slightly deeper yellow or tan color on this slide in Northern France. And I'll come back to that later. But nearly all of these swords are variations on this theme. Here we look at an example from the River Rhine near Mainz. And you can see the gold inlays occur on the front of the blade. And there's a circle and a crescent, and then there's a long line. Now, I've called them stamps. These are probably engraved and then filled with gold foil. When this sword was first published back in 1900, it was suggested that there were gold rays around the circle. And because of that, it was thought that these were representations of the sun and the moon. And this was also thought to be the case with the sword found at Arach near. Munich. That was until the sword was looked at using X-ray fluorescence. Now, at the time, it was always noted that there were two small dots beneath the circle, and these didn't really attract much attention. But in 1973, X-rays and X-ray fluorescence indicated there were another three circles there. And even more interestingly, when Hermann Danheimer looked at the other side, he found there were other symbols. And these images have been kind of prepared specially for us this evening by the State Collection in Munich. What we can see on this is the gold, and on the back, the inlays are with some form of uh, bronze, perhaps copper, but more likely a bronze alloy. And the image that we see in a simplified form is like this. So there's a clear difference in color. And what Danheimer argued was that we're looking at the four phases of the moon. From left to right, we'd be looking at the full moon. Then we would have the waning moon, then the waxing moon. And then the circle with the Triskele in it is interpreted as being the new moon, the Triskele often being interpreted as a symbol for light or the sun in Iron Age archaeology. Now, <clears throat> there was some debate about whether this was correct. It, it was suggested that rather than being five stars, we might be looking at uh, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. But the problem with that interpretation is you can't see the sun and these stars at the same time. And more work just in 2015 by Peter Kurtzman indicated that there are yet more symbols. And so he was able to identify another two circles and show that this vertical line extended further. And what he interprets this as, I think quite plausibly, is a representation 
of the Pleiades. And the thing about the Pleiades is they're only visible in the Northern Hemisphere in the winter months, essentially from October into April. And often they're at their brightest around November. So we are, I think, looking at a, a plausible representation of the cycle of the moon with a clear division between the full moon and the new moon. And we see this perhaps most clearly on an image here, uh, a representation by NASA of phases of the moon, where you see on the left, full moon, and the new moon is barely visible, but you see both the presence of the waxing and the waning moon occur within a few days of each other. And of course, this reminds us of the representation of the Pleiades on the famous Nebra disk that dates to the Middle Bronze Age at about 1600 BC. But let's go back to the Iron Age, but we'll take a stop in the Roman period before we get there. Because when I looked at these symbols many years ago in a paper published in the Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society, I suggested that the line between the symbols on the front of the sword was related to an idea that we see on bronze calendars found in France. And if we look just at the detail, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about these. Now, these calendars date to about the second or third centuries AD, so they're several centuries later than the swords, but they have a calendar that is marked in the Gaulish language. And this presumably is a codification in Roman times of an existing understanding of how a calendar should work. And the calendar covers about a, a five year period. And it, in its simplest form, these calendars are bronze tablets about two meters wide and a meter high. And it is thought that they were seen in temples. And they allow for a quite complicated reading of time and its recording. So the little holes you can see in the photograph on the left would allow you to put a peg in next to a particular day. And without going into too much detail in this, the calendars allow you to reconcile the difference between the Earth's rotation round the sun, which takes 365 days, but the lunar cycle of the moon going around the Earth, which is 355. So there's always a shortfall. The two are always out of kilter. And you need to find a way of reconciling these two things if you're using solar imagery and celestial bodies as a way of marking time. Each month is divided by the word atinox. And it is believed that this means returning light. So essentially it divides the month into a period when it's darker and a month when it's lighter. And it would seem that the year starts in November. And this is the only month that is marked by having a feast of its own. If we step across to literary sources, some of which are contemporary with the Iron Age. Julius Caesar tells us that the Gauls, so he's writing here about central France, counted the time in nights and that the night comes before day. Other mentions, for example, a bit later by Pliny, describe how the beginning of the month and the beginning of the year is set in relation to the phases of the moon. So all in all, both the evidence of these short swords, later evidence of calendars and references by classical writers, some contemporary, some a wee bit later, suggest that the night is used to mark time. But how were these little short swords used? Well, I just touched briefly on the one sword that I said was different, and it's different because it's slightly longer it's not a proper short sword, it's from Cosnes in Marne. And the inlays, the circle and the crescent, the two phases of the moon, are on the back of the sword. What's on the front is the representation in gold of two animals, one of which is a ram. And I would fancifully suggest this is a representation 
of the beasts that would be sacrificed in ceremonies and sacrifices that are conducted in relating to defining and defining what is a good or propitious time. It's counting the nights to determine what is propitious day. But let's bring us back to Penbrin. Now, I wrote back in the 90s a book on the Druids, and it's available in all good secondhand booksellers. But I was struck in doing that, that the Penbrin spoon had a gold inlay. And so I made an appointment to see the objects in the Ashmolean Museum. And I was surprised to discover that there was another inlay unnoticed in the bottom, and another one there in the right hand left-hand corner, and where there was a hole in the top right-hand corner, it was clear that this had also been the site of another inlay. And so we have here four circles divided by a cross, and essentially my interpretation of this is driven by what I'd seen with a short sword. Now, we're able, thanks to analysis by Dr. Peter Northover, to use the date of the uh, gold as an indicator of the date of the spoon. So the gold inlay in this example is closest to coins that date to the first half of the first century BC. So we get a date from this, but also Peter's analysis allows us to show very clearly that the lower inlay on the left, the high tin bronze would have made sure that it was a very different color from the gold. So, in short, I suggested that these spoons are used in divination, and what would have been practiced was passing something, either a powder or a liquid or maybe light, through the hole in the one on the left and seeing where it landed, in which phase of the moon it landed in the spoon on the right. So, that is how we go from moons on swords the moons on spoons. Now, when I published that paper, um, there were questions that I couldn't answer, one of which was, why was Castle Nadoli translated as meaning Castle Christmas? But also it was said to have been found under a pile of stones in the praetorium of a fort. Now, a praetorium, praetorium is a commanding officer's house in a Roman fort, so I, I was puzzled. But fortunately, the Iron Age archaeology of Wales has been blessed in recent years by some excellent work, some outstanding discoveries, and much of that has been done by Toby Driver, who is too modest to mention it himself, but has authored an excellent book on the hill forts of this region. And as part of that work, he has returned to Castle Brentlin, Castle Nadolig, excuse me, and Toby will now pick up the baton. Thank you, Andrew. That's wonderful. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, for the, uh, the plug as well. That's very kind indeed. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, Andrew's introduction there is perfect to explain or to set the scene for this extraordinary symbolism that we find on these unusual spoons. And also the extraordinary rarity of the gold inlay that we have on the Penbrim pair, which remains unique uh, to that pair of Iron Age spoons in the British Isles. I'm going to look in a bit more detail now at their fine spot. Uh, Castec Nadolig here basking in the sunshine in 2018 and the drought on the coastal plain of West Wales, uh, Cardiganshire Ceredigion, the county, some two kilometres from the coast. I'm going to look at the hill fort in its regional context. I'm going to look at the uh, circumstances of the discovery of the Pembrin spoons and set the scene a bit more about what we know about Iron Age spoons in Britain and look at a new corpus that's been put together of them. And then we'll finish by looking at the new investigation of the Hillfort and what it's discovered. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have in the audience Tyvee and Jenny Davis of Temple Bar Farm who own uh, the fort, has been in the family nearly a century, over a century. And without their kind permission to work on this private farmland, we wouldn't know what we know now uh, about this interesting site. So we're looking down on Castecadolic here, 
uh, about two kilometers from the coast. It's a concentric Iron Age hill fort. Uh, those are fairly common in the archeology span of Southwest Wales. Uh, what is unusual about Castaca Dolig is its sheer size. It encloses nearly four hectares. It's the second largest hill fort in the county of Ceredigion. Uh, you can see its size compared to the lorries passing it here. We have an inner enclosure, potentially the Praetorium where the spoons were discovered in 1829, an outer concentric enclosure, truncated remains of a main southeast gateway here, but unusually for all other hill forts in Ceredigion of this character, a large annex appended to the east side here. Um, a camp adjoining the other camp where we do have potentially additional burial evidence. The name, as Andrew said, uh, Christmas Castle in Welsh, um, and it's had that name, a curious appellation, as antiquarians have said, since the 1570s. Uh, it does sum up or does conjure up the idea of potentially seasonal ceremonies at this site. It's a unique place name. Uh, but uh, more recently, uh, it's been pointed out, uh, Eston Jones, the archaeologist, has raised the potential of the nodal element in it, uh, a hill in a prominent or special place, which is used locally as well. So it may be the castle in a prominent or special place. That's an alternative indication of the nodolic or nodolic. We don't have any excavation evidence from the site, uh, but it broadly dates to the Iron Age. The gold inlay on the spoon is no later than the first century BC. And in 2021, during a walkover survey of the fort, we literally stumbled across uh, the fragments of a middle uh, Iron Age style saddle quern uh, cleared amongst stone in the western part of the fort. Uh, really nice to see this sort of stuff coming up. The first uh, saddle quern from southwest Wales as well. So we have a broad indication of Iron Age date and Iron Age occupation uh, for this interesting site. The setting of Castec Adolig is defined by water and springs. Here we have the hill fort at the top, springs shown with stars here. Many of these pointed out to me by Tyve and Jenny walking around the site. But it was a surprise to me when I first visited in 2015 to note that right inside the hill fort, with the uh, finds evidence of the Pembrin spoons, we had a very large rock cut spring, about 12 meters across. It's overlain by a post medieval field boundary and shown on 18th century estate maps. So it has some certain antiquity to it. Also, more recently, uh, I've come to realize uh, that there's a spring head to the east of the fort as well, uh, visible in this aerial photograph, very large spring head from which issues a coastal stream down to the beach at Penbryn. And with the context of the, of the hill fort nearby, this could also be seen as a potential area for ceremony and deposition in the environs of the fort. Looking at the regional uh, setting of the hill fort here as well, um, Castec and Dolly is down here in the south of the county. There are about 230 Iron Age hill forts in the county of Ceredigion. In the south, part of the county where we have very high grade agricultural land, about 60 sites are preserved, but those in orange you'll see are crop marks. So upstanding earthworks are very rare. Uh, and uh, really Castec and Dolly is one of the very few that survives uh, in this sort of lowland area here, bounded by the River Tyvee. Um, uh, we have some very good excavation evidence in the region over the years by Ken Murphy and Harold Mightum, the work of the David Archaeological Trust published in 2011 in the Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society. And looking at sort of local chronology, uh, one site is useful to see the Fun on Wen defended enclosure, seven kilometers west of Castor Cadolig, excavated in 2006. And that confirms a sort of regional uh, story of uh, a sort of early Iron Age uh, palisaded gully uh, founding the settlement, 700 to 400 BC in that radiocarbon plateau. And then middle to late Iron Age, dense roundhouse settlement uh, with pottery and good finds and the reoccupation in the Roman period to the second century AD, following which there's a degradation of the defenses and an abandonment of the site. We may be seeing something similar for Castor Cadolig. The local map here shows Castor Cadolig uh, in relation to the coast. The modern road passes the site quite close by, formalized by the turnpike in 1770, but I think this is probably an ancient ridgeway. You see how it skirts the watersheds of all these uh, inland and uh, coastal rivers, quite difficult country otherwise. And Castor Cadolig is set centrally sited on this rounded summit on a watershed plateau heading down to the beach, on which are quite a concentration of interesting sites, not least the Corbelengi stone, a prehistoric standing stone 
with Roman cremations at its base and then a major early medieval inscription on its stone as well. We also have uh, an Iron Age gold coin from Pembrim Parish illustrated in Camden's Britannia. It seems to be a genuine find, one of 17 from Wales and the only one on the west coast of Wales, which is in the same parish as Castic Adolic. So it's a very interesting part of the world. Before the current investigation, we had no evidence of upstanding barrows or burial mounds uh, in Castec Nadolic, despite uh, antiquarian evidence, which we'll see. But we're very fortunate to have very good early tourist literature. And I'm absolutely indebted to Michael Freeman, uh, who's done a lot of work on this over the last three or four years and shared his results. We see field descriptions in the 19th century, people passing Castec Nadolic and a barrow or and some tumuli. Uh, this is a 1787 estate map showing the western part of the fort. Unfortunately, no indication of burial mounds on this, but there's quite a lot of evidence that there were mounds to see by travelers. Other travelers also noted that you could walk by it and not notice it. And this is the, the quandary with Castic Adolig, which we'll see at the end. The second largest hill fort in Keredigian, which actually is quite insubstantial in the landscape. It's very interesting. And then in 1859, the Cambrians on their cardigan visit visited Castor Cadolic, but before wider knowledge of the spoons uh, had been published and noted there in a camp that joins onto the main work, presumably that annex there, but we don't know, uh, that lately three urns have been discovered and there were bones seen on the surface. The urns have disappeared, uh, but it's been postulated they could either be early Bronze Age or Iron Age indeed. Uh, Castle Bucket in um, uh, Bucket Camp in Pembrokeshire has Iron Age urn burials from it as well. So burials pouring out of the site there in the late 19th century or mid 19th century. So here we could feast again on the glory that is the Pembrin spoons. Uh, and this wonderful picture courtesy of the Ashmolean's picture library. I'm very grateful to let us use the image here. Um, and look at the, the circumstances of the discovery. And in this wonderful paper, Barnwell's paper in 1862, uh, bronze articles supposed to be spoons. That was the title of the paper. Uh, we see here, his observations were in the printer's hands when accidentally uh, the, another pair of spoons was discovered in the Ashmolean. This is how they were brought to light. And here we have these, these sort of few details of the discovery. The tenant farmer clearing stones in 1829 in the Praetorium discovering the spoons as well. And Barnwell says it's much to be desired that the local secretary it, uh, makes contact uh, with the cardigan office and sees if the farmer is still alive, to see if there's any other evidence that came out of the ground with the spoons. And as, to, as far as we're aware, uh, this was never done or the farm was never, never traced down. We can see the quality of the preservation of the spoons. They have undergone quite a lot of conservation over their time, they've been heavily lacquered, but structurally uh, they're very well preserved. And actually we have very acidic subsoils in West Wales, bronze and bone uh, disappear unless calcined or burnt, or unless coming from a charcoal rich or alkali deposit. And it's long been suggested that preservation spoons owes to their uh, in, in burial with uh, a body or cremation burial as well. In addition, Peter Northover's uh, methodological analysis of the bronze, uh, in the mid 2000s uh, suggested a high zinc uh, content to the bronze and potentially a source at Thanamunach, the copper ore uh, on the Welsh English border. So they may well be actual Welsh spoons, which is interesting. Let's set these in a bit more context. Uh, Andrew's touched upon the special and unusual nature of these uh, so-called spoons. So they're oval, flattish, about the size of your hand, quite large objects. Uh, tapering to a point. These are the electrotype copies of the Pembrin spoons, kindly lent by the Keredigan Museum for some photography. But you see the Nestcliffe spoons on display in Shrewsbury Museum are quite dished. And the Ditchingham spoon as well, recently discovered, has quite a dished bowl. Uh, one is cross incised, one is usually perforated, except in a very few examples. The Nestcliffe spoons have a tear on one side. But the, here we have the, the sort of telling evidence. There are 27 of these ever found representing 17 pairs and only five found in the last century, which I think surely represents a mechanization of rural industries of ditch digging and stone clearance. 
Uh, the Ditchingham spoon was fa thankfully found by a metal detectorist in dredgings from the River Waveney near Bungay a few years back. But they're very, very rare. Where we have context, we have association with graves or burials and springs. Here we have the distribution here in terms of context, we have three spoons which have pronounced coastal aspect. Those at Bournemouth and the borders, seven and eight, within sight of the sea, Deal and Kent, within sight of the sea as well, and Cassock and Dolig, no doubt from a burial as well. Uh, actual evidence of uh, discovery and inhumations uh, come from Bournemouth in the borders here, where the spoons are placed uh, next to the individual's face, uh, covered by an iron knife. Um, uh, at Pony in France, pairs 26 to 27, the Marne Valley, the burial of a woman in her 40s or 50s, with the spoons on her right hand side covered by a bronze bowl. Uh, and then also in Dealing Kent, uh, spoons recovered with an inhumation burial, Grave X2, in excavations before 1904. We also have an association with water and springs. Uh, particularly those from Graeber, Crosby, Crosby Wavensworth, these unusual spoons, uh, unparalleled in other pairs, uh, dug up when a farmer was looking to improve a spring for cows on his land in a dry period. Uh, we also have the Western Bath spoons discovered about two meters down from the expansion of a quarry uh, where a rivulet was issuing uh, to start a spring. Uh, and also uh, we have uh, association with springs uh, with the Castle and Dolly pair, but also ditching from the River Waveney. Those from Ireland have all been found with peat cutting or during peat cutting, so we, we lack that detailed context. Just looking at the discovery of the, the other Welsh pair, Fenogion here, a map done for this present study. These were discovered, uh, dug out during the construction of a railway cutting and left on the spoil tip, and then rain washed them off and they were recovered. Uh, but just putting this together in this current study, I realized that they lie just west, 500 meters west of a Romana British lowland temple in the Vale of Cloyd. Very rare. There are four of these in eastern Wales. And two, this one and another, seem to suggest the uh, continuation of a likely Iron Age sanctuary. Uh, and so the association with the spoons and a lowland sanctuary is very interesting indeed. These kicked everything off. These, this pair, they were discovered and taken to the local headmaster of Riffin School for identification who happened to be Reverend Barnwell, uh, who then a year later published his paper. So we thank the discovery of the Fenogion spoons for bringing the spoons of Britain and Ireland to wider attention. Now it seemed right to bring some order to the study of the Iron Age spoons of the British Isles. And to that end, foolishly or not, I attempted a new illustrated corpus and typology to bring some rigor to the study. This new typology is based on design and characteristics of the spoons. In terms of spoon typology, we have the bowl and the handle, a shoulder joins those two together. That sometimes enlarges to a flange, and you may then have a tab uh, or a thumb handle uh, within that, and the tab may be accentuated and enlarged within that flange handle. And this uh, illustrates uh, Andrew's sort of definitive gazetteer of the spoons, hope to publish an archaeologist cambrensis with a paper on the Castic and Adolic uh, discoveries. Why a new corpus? Uh, the publication record over the last 150 years is quite fragmented. Um, James Craw in 1924 was the last person to publish an illustrated gazetteer of the known spoons. Uh, Raftery in 1984 proposed two types, uh, broadly the southern types, his type one, which is everything on the left-hand side here, really, and broadly the Northern and Irish type, which are very different. The Irish types tend to have a bowl, same sort of size as the handle, and these we see in uh, Catchapenny and Bournemouth as well. And then the very unusual uh, Crosby Ravensworth spoons in the British Museum. But it's essential for the comparison of new finds. More recently, in the last 20 years, we've had the Ditchingham spoon discovered, and the Kinton Nescliffe pair as well. Uh, you know, with a portable antiquity scheme, it's going to be useful to be able to pull a, a diagram out and quickly see what we have. Also putting these together, we one realizes for the first time really that the Kinton Nescliffe pair are very similar to those from Pony in France, the only pair with a very, very simple tab handle, even though this, the bowl shapes are, are different. And the uh, drawing up of this typology begins to draw out other uh, themes and ideas as well. 
Uh, the type two spoons are all very similar, which has been remarked upon throughout the 20th century. But we see here the Mill Hill deal, deal pair with a riveted central section in the handle and the Westmeath example, almost identical, which is missing its riveted section. We begin to wonder about manufacture and workshops. So similarly with type 3A, the Penbrin pair, and the similarity with the London River Thames spoon, first noted by Craw back in 1924. Uh, and it struck me actually, putting this talk together, that we are missing the cross in size spoon from the River Thames example. And what if that also has a gold inlay, given the handle designs are similar? That's entirely speculation. But Braun's analysis of this spoon would show whether or not it's related to the Pembrin example. Now, there are other ways to, to slice these up. And Andrew, in discussion, quite rightly pointed out, we have good context, good dated context uh, for some of these spoons. Otherwise, we have datable elements for the Laten designs on the handles, particularly the late designs on Crosby Ravensworth. So there are other ways that this could be done. But this is one way to propose a simple uh, sort of splitting up of the spoons into four types. So with this evidence, with the importance of the spoons, it seemed natural to reinvestigate the fine spot, Castor Cadolic. Uh, and we had plenty of research questions at the start of 2019, going into a new survey by the Royal Commission uh, for the site. Uh, Iron Age burials are extremely rare in Wales. Oliver Davis published a paper in the Journal of Oxford Archaeology about five years ago. Very rare, lots of questions outstanding. Uh, an unexcavated hill fort, so no understanding of the internal layout as well. But one of the critical discoveries was the 2018 Pembrokeshire chariot burial, discovered in a very un Iron Age looking ring ditch, a Penalina ring ditch, on the approaches to a hill fort, a promontory fort. An archaeologist realized for the first time that we hadn't been investigating the approaches of hill forts. This is not somewhere we ever have ever been looking. And if we'd found a, a circular barrow on the approach to a hill fort with geophysical survey, we would dismiss it as early Bronze Age in date. Now we know through that discovery and one at Llandalo School recently as well, that we have nine meter to 15 meter circular ditches enclosing Iron Age burials in Wales. And that's only in the last five years that's come out. So here's uh, Rob and team from SUMO, who did an excellent job uh, to do a new high resolution survey of the site. So I'm very grateful to the Royal Commission for funding nearly eight hectares of uh, magnetometry across the site here, both covering the uh, western rear of the fort, the main fort itself and annex, and the eastern approaches here uh, coming up to Temple Bar Farm. And you can see even at this uh, sort of pulled out stage, major uh, pieces of uh, structure are coming through. Uh, the ramparts clarified here where they bound the annex with a, a new gateway confirmed here with uh, orange, the high magnetic response in the terminals of the gateway. Structural evidence for the uh, slighted southeast gateway here, which is uh, sort of crunched by the turnpike road and even some quite uh, sort of heavy handed ridge and furrow cultivation one quadrant of the fort as well. So a lot of new detail to pour over. Looking at the main results from the survey, one of the critical things that came up uh, were a pair of new ring ditches in the interior of the inner circle of the fort here. Quite heavily plow braided here, but definitely there, check with the Sumo people as well. The Northern one almost completely plowed away. Uh, these measure about 20 meters diameter. It's not unusual in, uh, in hill forts in Southwest Wales to have uh, barrows at the center, uh, but here these large monuments uh, would have really dominated this interior and blocked the entrance as one comes in as well. Uh, looking at comparative excavation evidence from the Plasca Girthen site near Aberystwyth, excavated in 1986, where we had Iron Age boulder capped burials, boulder capped inhumation graves. Those were in the lee of Bronze Age barrows and then Iron Age cremations in the ditches of the barrows as well. So we could assume that if we had Iron Age burials here, they would be around those uh, early Bronze Age type larger barrows. Second big discovery in the annex itself was confirmation of a likely barrow mound here, and you can see it on the geophysics, incorporated in the uh, annex earthworks here. Uh, previous surveys of these uh, gateway earthworks suggested uh, that the mounds are to do with the, the gateway terminals. And what you can see now is the low mound preserved within the fort may well be a barrow mound enclosed within the hill fort. The geophysics also showed this inner gate, east-facing gate, 
a and potentially a narrow east facing outer gate as well. Quite an unusual arrangement for a fort that already has a main gateway. Uh, we'll come back to that. Perhaps the most exciting discovery from the survey, and I won't locate it precisely, is an entirely new barrow group outside uh, of the hill fort. What we have here, a repair of large early Bronze Age star barrows, again, 15 and 17 meters diameter. This is the southern one. It's a very tenuous 20 centimeter high earthwork uh, surviving there, but there's something just there. But more interesting is a line of three, up to three smaller nine meter diameter ring ditches. The suggestions of inhumation burials, or what's I'm saying, suggestions of grave cuts in the center, uh, which chatted to Ken Murphy at the David Trust, who worked in the Pembrokeshire uh, chariot burial, is happy that those are probably Iron Age in date as well. And in addition, uh, an early medieval style square barrow, again, not uncommon outside West Wales hill forts, showing this continuing reverence of uh, these structures in the post Roman period. So, very exciting to have this, these barriers on the approaches uh, to the fort as well. All of which suggests the potential development of the main fort uh, with a rear gate, the main southeast gateway, and also then a restricted east gate into the interior. Those are the springs there, potentially occupying a site already which had uh, which already had three barrows on it. It's not unusual to have this strange narrow gate. We see a crop mark about 10 miles away from Casa Cadolic, much lighter construction than the fort we have there, but with a narrow, a narrow gate with large terminals and a sort of inner swing gate to allow stock potentially into the outer enclosure here and a rear gate. Uh, but then a development of the annex potentially, untested by excavation with the even more restricted eastern gate. So that's a potential basic two-phase chronology we have. Now, what's very interesting, just before Christmas, Michael Freeman, the former curator of the Caradigan Museum, uh, stumbled across some new documentary evidence in the Bodleian Library, a, pro or a reply to the parochial inquiries of Edward Lloyd in 1693 by schoolmaster William Gamble, who visited Castig Adolic and drew a survey of it, but that doesn't survive. And uh, this is absolutely brilliant because it backs up the geophysics. Uh, the two, well, the two ramparts, the entries look towards the east, the outward entry being two yards wide, 1.8 meters, with a stone on each side of the entry. And he gives dimensions to those stones, only two meters high. Obviously, quite, quite high. So a slab lined narrow entrance would be unusual at an Iron Age hill fort. But that said, we have promontory forts in Pembrokeshire, Portha Rao, excavated last year, which has a one and a half meter wide post defined entrance for a large fort. Uh, just as you know, as big as two double doors, essentially. So this is very interesting. Now, there are not many stones surviving a Castor Cadolic now, apart from those small ones in field walls. What we do have, as pointed out to me a couple of years ago by Tyvee and Jenny, are a couple of large flat slabs of Puntin stone, local stone, near the road in the modern gate. And actually, with this documentary evidence here, it seems likely, though it would be difficult to prove, that we may have fragments of the outer gateway, the eastern gateway uh, surviving. So which leads me to sum up here now really, and to reflect upon what we have at Castec and Adolic. Now I'm very used in, in Ceredigion, Cardiganshire, to writing about the monumentality of Iron Age hill forts, the aggrandizement of forward facing ramparts and ditches to make the hill fort seem more impressive, and more awe inspiring and terrifying to those people approaching it. Interiors are often on show as well. What we have at Castec Adonic is entirely the opposite. Here we are looking from the east over the ramparts of the annex with the inner rampart beyond. You can see it's quite a substantial rampart when one gets close to it. Here with the Hillfall Study Group last year, two to three meter high rampart. But what we have is a rampart so tall and a, a local summit so rounded and flat that one can't see in readily from the outside. Um, and once one's inside, today one gets a view over the top of the rampart a bit to the coast, but with rampart top palisades, as we'd expect, one would be completely closing off this interior from view. Uh, and so what do we make of this, uh, these sort of appearance of privacy, concealment on site? And I feel personally, though we can't test this without extensive excavations, is that we can't separate out the very, very unusual finds on the site uh, which deal with div divination and ceremony with a potential 
privacy and concealment aspects we have at this site. Now we have an imaginative reconstruction of Casa Cadolica here around 50 BC based partly on the geophysics uh, with the large barrows uh, dominating the summit of the annex here, these narrow east gates and the main southeast gate linking potentially to that ridgeway. Um, and the survey, you know, to sort of sum up has revealed nine new barrows or ring ditches, three of which are definitely of Iron Age character. But I would assume that what we're looking for is potentially boulder capped Iron Age burials that we had at Gurgurthen in Aberystwyth and at the uh, Pembrokeshire Chariot burial as well. Those may be the stones cleared by the tenant farmer that revealed the burial. And we're not going to find those on, on geophysics, uh, but they may be there in the lee of these barrows. But further questions remain about the hill fort, particularly uh, how one navigated from the main gate here through to the interior. Or was that just through these east facing gates? I've been over the geophysics, the magnetometry, and I can't see any clear break between the inner and outer enclosures structurally. So, in conclusion, how do we now view Casta Cadolic? Is it just another hill fort, or do the spoons and the burials and its large size elevate its significance and change the way we view it? The rarity of the spoons in a British context suggests, perhaps not unreasonably, that the practices that went on here with the spoons at their heart were highly specialized and perhaps the work of an important religious person. Were they resident at this site or did they visit? We won't know. Or they were interred with the tools of their trade. The number of springs suggests that water may have been a key part of why the fort was sited here, but it seems that barrow mounds had already claimed this hill summit in the early Bronze Age, with the Iron Age builders acquiring this old ancestral power within their new ramparts. On the subject of the new investigation, Wales has many famous celebrated prehistoric artifacts in museums across Britain, but only a very few have had their original find spots revisited. Similarly, fine spots of several of the known Iron Age spoons of Britain are still extant in the landscape. Given sufficient funding, the reinvestigation of some of these fine spots, even with geophysics, could be very worthwhile. So here in the parish of Pembryn in Ceredigion, I think we can recognize a real shift in our knowledge of a monument and can tell a new story about the archeological context of the exceptionally rare Pembryn spoons. And I'll leave you here uh, with our email addresses if you need to get in touch, with some further reading, uh, an article in preparation by Andrew, myself, and with help from Peter Reville, uh, who's been so helpful uh, on these spoons, uh, and Andrew's original article uh, in 2007. We have many people to thank. I won't thank them individually, uh, but particularly the work of Peter Northover, uh, uh, Peter Reville as well, were helping us. And of course, the, the landowners as well, without whom this study couldn't have gone ahead. Many thanks indeed. Thank you so much, Toby and uh, Andrew, for a um, really splendid lecture um, that does that wonderful antiquarian thing of looking from objects to landscape and back to the objects. And that's uh, where so much uh, information comes out. And it's really interesting to see this. Uh, those objects really given um, sort of new meaning by by your your field work. I wonder whether before I open it up the floor up to questions, I could just um, ask one of my own. Um, looking at that, the topography of your hill fort and the location of the springs, um, and the the sort of structure of it, I'm sort of reminded of. Uh, communities that rely on stock and enclosing animals and so forth. Is that how you would see the broad economy and society in that part of Wales at that time? Yeah, this is the uh, the tension with the, the the finds of sort of high end artifacts like the spoons, but also very mundane artifacts like the Middle Iron Age quern. Uh, uh, so we have agricultural processes going on here. Uh, and no doubt, the management of livestock, uh, it seems to be a pastoral economy in southwest Wales here, though we do have four posters for grain storage as well. Uh, so a site this large is not going to be solely a place for ceremony and ritual. Uh, 
going to have its life before that and after the spoons as well, and probably reoccupation to the Roman period. Uh, so there's a mundane and functional and practical reason why one needs water. Uh, but the occurrence of that very large spring right at the heart of the port is more unusual in, in, in terms of what we know about the hills of West Wales. Um, someone on Zoom asks, can anything be inferred from, inferred from the stamped roundels on the handle, and are they different on different spoons? Uh, the, the, the spoon decoration, Andrew, I might hand over to you in a second, but I, the, I, I recently saw a, a PhD thesis by a student from Kent uh, from about 10 years ago, and she made, I've not seen it before actually, a parallel between uh, the Ipswich Talks in East Anglia and this vegetal, vegetal uh, sort of uh, sort of vine leaves, leaf based decoration on the Pembrine spoon handles. Um, so there is potentially more uh, stylistic work to do on some of those handles there, as, as it were. But, uh, you know, even in that basic typology I put together, it doesn't cross that bridge and study all those very complex Latin designs we have on particularly the Irish spoons. Thank you. That was an absolutely fascinating talk. I was curious about the history of the hill fort. You, you speak obviously that it has got this long pedigree, but at the time that the spoons are being deposited, is there any evidence that there is settlement there at all, given that it's an unusual character? Or is this a, a place that is being used for very particular non-domestic purposes, and that's why it attracts the, the deposit of the spoon? Very interesting, isn't it? Um, we seem to have uh, far more burials within and outside this fort than we could have ever imagined. Um, and uh, if we have, uh, you know, people visiting the individual using these spoons at a time for particular divination or particular things to be answered, uh, you know, uh, auspicious times in which for them to begin construction of a hill fort or to hold a wedding or to, uh, to initiate conflict, that sort of thing. One would assume if the person who was interred with the spoons was resident at the hill fort, uh, then for a time this became a very important place in the landscape. Um, how do we read the rarity of this artifact type as well in the British Iron Age? Uh, the, the finds have obviously dropped off since 1923. Uh, many have been lost, but they're not very common. Uh, so does their discovery at Castec Adolig immediately elevate the function of that fort for the time of the spoons to something quite different from all the other forts in the area. Uh, and I think this, is, this shows how basic our understanding is of ceremonial use of hill forts in the Welsh Iron Age, that's what I know. And it's only just coming through. The Pembrokeshire chariot burial was discovered outside an inland promontory fort, a fairly mundane looking inland promontory fort. Now we know it had this extraordinarily special burial on the approach, um, uh, you know, which has blown Welsh archaeology out of the water, really. So there are many more questions to ask, answer and to ponder over, I think, about yeah, the ceremonial function of some of these monuments. Can I um, thank you both again for a really wide ranging and very stimulating talk, which I think has, uh, as you said in your concluding comments, uh, really opens up the subject of other people going back and doing similar things elsewhere, which is how we'll, we'll build the subject in the future. So can we express our thanks to our speakers again? <laughs>